Hi, my name is Jeff Price. I'm the CEO and founder of Audium. I'm also the founder and former CEO of TuneCore, and before that, I ran a record label for about uh, 17 and a half years. So I recently invited people to tweet me questions they had about the music industry, about mechanical royalties, musical compositions, sound recordings, so I could give you answers back to help you out. How can you make decisions without information, right? So I uh, got some questions in, and I'm going to read one of them. I'm going to do multiple videos, each one for different questions. And this first question came in from somebody named Chris. It's a long question, so bear with me. Chris asks, how to best set up my infrastructure as an independent artist? That's his first sort of question. And what services should we invest in to start to build our infrastructure to start and to build a sustainable career? Well, doing the following set me up to build my career besides the music. Anything I should add or change? And then he lists six things. Signing up with BMI or ASCAP, starting my own publishing company and then joining ASCAP or BMI, uh, get an administration deal, register with Sound Exchange, sign up with a distribution company, what's the best way to collect mechanical royalties, should I change things and so forth. So it's a great question to start with because it touches a lot of areas and um, I'll try to get into that. Uh, before I do, I kind of want to set the table. So there are uh, two copyrights in each piece of recorded music and most of you know this, but what the heck. Sony Records hires Whitney Houston to sing I Will Always Love You, right? And that's the recording of the song. However, Dolly Parton wrote the lyric and the melody. And those are the two copyrights, one for the recording and a second separate copyright for the lyric and melody, which is called the musical composition. Two licenses, two royalties, two payments. So what I'm gonna do today is discuss specifically the Dolly Parton side of things, the musical composition. And I'm gonna start by pointing to what's up here on the whiteboard, which has been written out with great care. Yeah, I write like a six-year-old, what can I say? So uh, this is the foundation and basis to basically all the licensing and collection, how the rules work, when you should get a license, the terminologies and so forth. And I'm gonna start over here, where you can see I got three things written. Now, when you write a song, meaning you make it tangible, meaning you either write it down or record it, the instant that happens, the instant, the moment, uh, you get a copyright. That looks like that. That copyright is for the musical composition, the lyric and the melody. It is not that. That P in a circle represents phonogram or the sound recording, the Sony Records part of it. We're doing the Dolly Parton part of it. Copyright for the musical composition. So if you wrote a song called, oh my God, this video is really boring, you would instantly, and recorded it or wrote it down, you would become three things. You're the songwriter because you wrote the song. You're the music publisher because you own the copyright to the song. And you're the publishing administrator because it is now your job to license and collect the revenue that your copyright makes when it gets used. So publishing administrator now has to deal with what I call six slices of copyright. You see, when you get this let me get that out of the way. When you get this copyright here to your musical composition, you now have to license and collect, you don't have to, but if you wanna make a business of it, license and collect off of these sort of six slices, I call them. So you have the right of public performance, the right of reproduction, the right of derivatives, the right of public display, the right of distribution, and the right of digital transmission. These are the six slices of copyright that you, as the publishing administrator, have to license and collect throughout the world if you'd like to make money off of your musical composition or make sure people are properly licensed. So the question is, how do you do that? But before we go further, let me explain some weird terminologies we have in the music industry. The first one is, if you are a person who has written that song, and let's say you wrote it all by yourself, so you own 100% of it, there you are, Okay, you are in what we call in the music industry a self-published songwriter. You're a self-published songwriter because you are the songwriter, you are the publisher because you own it, and you're the administrator because it is your job to license and collect the money from these sort of six slices of copyright. However, you can do a deal with somebody else. 
All right, here's somebody else. And we'll make this person a cigar smoker because that's the way I listen to these. Okay, you can do a deal with this person where you assign to this person or this entity, this company, this right right here. You're gonna say, hey, I don't wanna deal with licensing and collecting the money. I just wanna write songs, I wanna own them, but can someone else do this work for me? In which case, you will do a rights assignment from you to them and they become the publishing administrator. I'm gonna shorten it, pub admin. So in this case, this particular songwriter, who's also the publisher, is saying, you deal with all the crap over here, I'm just gonna go make music, and it makes me much happier. So this is what we call a publishing administration deal. You are the songwriter and the publisher, you wrote it, you own it, but you're hiring this entity or this person to license and collect for this six thing. So these are the two ways we talk about mm, publishers in the music industry. You have a self-published songwriter, which is a person or entity that controls all three of these rights. Or you have a publishing administration deal where you have outsourced to someone else to do this part, in which case it's pub admin. Self-published songwriter, publishing administration deal. Notice though that in both cases, you're still dealing with these six slices of copyright, right? So let me move into this very quickly. Each one of these works differently than the other, although they're all kind of connected. I'm gonna truncate this so as not to turn this into a three hour video. The right of public performance means when your lyric and your melody, when your musical composition is publicly performed, usually in a setting where there's commerce or money involved. For example, public performance is when a television show uh, plays music, okay? A public performance is when AM or FM radio plays something. That's a public performance of the lyric and the melody. A public performance is also a stream on the internet. Every time there's a stream of a recording of your lyric and melody, whether or not you recorded it doesn't matter, it's a public performance. Same holds true when you're in an elevator and you hear music or a supermarket or a gym or a spa, public performance. The same holds true uh, when there was a ringback tone. The same holds true when, get this, when there's a download like in iTunes outside of the United States and Canada, primarily in the European Union and the United Kingdom, when there's a download, you also generate some public performance royalties. It's called the right of communication for those of you keeping tabs on stuff here. Anyway, <coughs> clearly a very difficult job to do. So how do you deal with the right of public performance, right? You need a giant ear that can listen to the world. And every time the lyric and melody that you wrote is performed, a live gig is another example of that, right? You, a band performs live, Metallica plays Budokan and covers Bob Dylan all along the Watchtower, that's Bob Dylan's song being performed live. It's a public performance of Bob Dylan's song. So how do you deal with this? Because over here, when you're a self-published songwriter, you have no infrastructure. You can't monitor every restaurant and bar and elevator on the planet. You can't go and watch every television show and, and listen to every stream that's occurring on YouTube and on other sites on the internet. So you outsource it. And what you do is you become a member of a performing rights organization, also called a PRO, performing rights organization. And what you're really doing is you're outsourcing to that PRO this one task. So in the United States, we have a number of PROs. We have ASCAP. We have BMI, we have CSAC, we have GMR. As these are examples of PROs. And what you're doing when you become a member of these organizations, you are hiring them to license and collect the money for this one thing. That is it. They don't do any of this other stuff, right? That's up to you still. And then these organizations have networks and relationships with other organizations where they reciprocate rights and collections. And ultimately their job is to put their ear to the world and license and collect all this money for you. 
But that leaves you with a problem. You got these other ones here. Now, before we get to the other ones, let's do the same thing now that you're a publishing administration deal, okay? The publishing administration deal, sorry, there's a long mic here. You've now assigned the right to them. They now have to deal with the right of public performance. Guess what they do? The exact same thing you do. They become a member of a performing rights organization and they are outsourcing to this organization the, um, the need to have them listen to the world, to the internet, to restaurants, license and collect that money. Now your question may be then, well, why do I need to do a deal with a publishing administrator if we both can become members of this organization and it's this organization that's actually doing the work? Won't they just be taking a cut of the money that comes from here before they give it to me here? And the answer is kind of yeah. Uh, for that one thing, you're right. You both can become members and you don't need them for that. You both have equal access to this. Now there's more that a publishing administrator does, but in that one case scenario, yeah, they're a middleman. However, they can bring additional value that can increase your public performance royalties. But let me just table that for a moment. So that's public performance. The right of reproduction, again, I'm doing truncated versions of this, is every time your lyric and melody, your composition gets legally reproduced, there needs to be a license and there's typically a payment. So what is a reproduction? A reproduction is a CD gets manufactured, a piece of vinyl gets manufactured, something physical gets manufactured. Every time that happens, it's considered a reproduction. And the royalties that are paid each time there's a reproduction are oddly enough called mechanical royalties. So I'm going to write that down just because it's really important you know what a mechanical royalty is. Mechanical royalty is each time mechanical royalty. Each time there is a, can you see that? Probably not. There you go. Each time there is a legal reproduction of your lyric and melody and there's a license, there needs to be a license and it triggers in most cases a mechanical royalty. And getting into that is very complex, so let me just table it there. So uh, that's part of the right of reproduction. The other part of reproduction is something we call synchronization. I'm just going to put sync. That's where your lyric and melody gets put into a, into a moving image and it gets synchronized with it. Remember, there's a recording and a composition. I'm talking about the composition. The composition, which is part of the recording, gets synchronized to a moving image. That is called a synchronization license and falls primarily under the right of reproduction. So the right of reproduction, sort of the two big buckets here are mechanical royalties and synchronization royalties. Oddly enough, mechanical royalties are regulated by the United States government. Uh, again, that's a whole tangential conversation. Synchronization royalties are not and allow for you to negotiate one-on-one -on -one without ever, any governmental intervention. The next one, something called derivatives. And derivatives are, uh, if you take a song and you translate it into another language, that's a derivative. So you need to get a special license for that. Or if you do a, um, uh, let's say you take a story, a, a, take a song and turn it into a book, that's a derivative. So translations, uh, another one is sampling. So you take Can't Touch This by MC Hammer, which is sampling Rick, Rick James. That's a derivative work. And again, you need a special license for that. Public display, very simply, think of lyrics. You can't put lyrics onto somebody's website any more than you can reprint the script to um, a Tennessee Williams play, right? It, those are yours, you own them, they're your copyright. So you need a license for that. Uh, distribution is the ability to commercially distribute the, the sound recording that embodies the composition and allow for commercialization of that. And it's kind of part of all of this. Sometimes these things mix together. And then digital transmission is the ability to take a recording that embodies a composition and then distribute it digitally like um, Sirius XM radio or Pandora online interactive streaming excuse me, online non-interactive or interactive streaming, which I'll explain in a moment, is a digital transmission because remember the world began with AM and FM radio. Digital came later in life, so they added this concept later in life. And I briefly talked about interactive and non-interactive streaming because I did. I'll touch on that for a second. An interactive stream is when you as the user can pick and choose what you want to listen to, like Spotify. I want to hear this song, that song I can skip, I can go backwards, I can go forwards, there's no limits on it. 
versus non-interactive, which is more like just listening to radio uh, through the internet, like the original Pandora, right? That's interactive versus non-interactive. So those are the six slices of copyright. The publishing administrator deals with licensing and collecting them. In many cases, it will outsource public performance. Uh, my company, Audium, is an outsource solution for these primarily. Right? We deal with the collection and licensing of mechanical royalties that come from a very particular type of use, streams. We only deal with streams. So in the United States, we don't collect the mechanical royalties from downloads, which basically have stopped. We don't collect mechanical royalties from physical manufacturing of CDs. We license and collect the mechanical royalties that come from streams that are happening on Spotify and Apple Music and Google Play and Amazon and 50 other music services, some of which you may not have heard of. And in addition, we represent this right, but only for YouTube at the moment. So we'll go into YouTube and we'll find videos that are using your copyright without a license. We'll say, hey, YouTube, we're going to authorize you to monetize this video, which has a recording in it most times, and the recording is of a composition, right? And then when the money shows up, we collect that as well. And we work just like BMI, ASCAP, and CSAC. We're a music rights organization for the right of reproduction. We're streaming mechanical royalties in the US and YouTube and also Canada and we license, collect, and then pay you back that money. So that is the foundation upon which most of your questions will come in. And I wanted to get that out there. And I suppose what I'm gonna do now, because this was a long video, stop here and then go to sort of a, a second part of Chris's question.